It is a ponderous chain. Scrooge glanced about him on the floor, in the expectation of finding himself surrounded by some fifty or sixty fathoms of iron cable. But he could see Jacob, he said, imploringly. Old Jacob Marley, tell me more. Speak comfort to me, Jacob. I have none to give, the ghost replied. It comes from other regions, Ebenezer Scrooge, and is conveyed by other ministers to other kinds of men. Nor can I tell you what I would. A very little more is all permitted to me. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger anywhere. My spirit never walked beyond our counting-house, mark me. In life my spirit never roved beyond the narrow limits of our money-changing hull and weary journeys lie before me. Pondering on what the ghost had said, he did so now, but without lifting up his eyes or getting off his knees. You must have been very slow about it, Jacob, Scrooge observed, in a business-like manner, though with humility and deference. Slow, the ghost repeated. Seven years dead, mused Scrooge, and traveling all the time, the whole time, said the ghost. No rest, no peace. Incessant torture of remorse. You travel fast, said Scrooge. On the wings of the wind, replied the ghost. You might have got over a great quantity of ground in seven years, said Scrooge. The ghost, on hearing this, set up another cry, and clanked its chain so hideously in the dead silence of the night that the ward would have been justified in indicting it for a nuisance. O oh, captive, bound and double-ironed, cried the phantom, not to know that ages of incessant labor were by immortal creatures, for this earth must pass into eternity, before. not to know that any Christian spirit working kindly in its little sphere, whatever it may be, will find its mortal life too short for its vast means of usefulness. Not to know that no space of regret can make amends for one life's opportunity misused. Yet such was I, oh, such was I, but you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Fault business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. It held up its chain at arm's length, as if that were the cause of all its unavailing grief, and at this time of the rolling year, the spectre said I suffer most. Why did I walk through crowds of fellow beings with my eyes turned down, and never raise them to that blessed star which led the wise men to a poor abode? Were there no poor homes to which its light would have conducted? Hear me? cried the ghost. My time is nearly gone. I will, said Scrooge. But don't be hard upon me. Don't be flowery, Jacob. Pray how it is that I appear before you in a shape that you can see, I may not tell. I have sat invisible beside you many and many a day. It was not an agreeable idea. Scrooge shivered and wiped the perspiration from his brow. That is no light part of my penance, pursued the ghost. I am here tonight to warn you that you have yet a chance and hope of escaping my fate, a chance and hope of my procuring, Ebenezer. You were always a good friend to me, said Scrooge. Thank you, you will be haunted, resumed the ghost, by three spirits. Scrooge's countenance fell almost as low as the ghost's had done. Is that the chance and hope you mentioned, Jacob? he demanded in a faltering voice. It is. I, I think I'd rather not, said Scrooge. Without their visits, said the ghost, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first tomorrow, when the bell tolls one. Couldn't I take him all at once, and have it over, Jacob, hinted Scrooge. Expect the second on the next night at the same hour, the third upon the next night when the last stroke of twelve has ceased to vibrate. Look to see me no more, and look that for your own sake. You remember what has passed between us. When it had said these words, the spectre took its wrapper from the table, and Scrooge knew this by the smart sound its teeth made when the jaws were brought together by the bandage. 
He ventured to raise his eyes again, and found his supernatural visitor confronting him in an erect attitude, with its chain wound over and about its arm. The apparition walked backward from him, and at every step it took, the window raised itself a little, so that when the spectre reached it, it was wide open. It beckoned Scrooge to approach, which he did. When they were within two paces of each other, Marley's ghost held up its hand, warning him to come no nearer. Scrooge stopped, not so much in obedience as in surprise and fear, for on the raising of the hand, he became sensible of confused noises in the air, incoherent sounds of lamentation. The spectre, after listening for a moment, joined in the mournful dirge, and floated out upon the bleak, dark night. Scrooge followed to the window, desperate in his curiosity. He looked out. The air was filled with phantoms, wandering hither and thither in restless haste, and moaning as they went. Every one of them wore chains like Marley's ghost. Some few, they might be guilty governments, were linked together. None were free. Many had been personally known to Scrooge in their lives. He had been quite familiar with one old ghost, in a white waistcoat, with a monstrous iron safe attached to its ankle, who cried piteously at being unable to assist a wretched woman. The misery with them all was clearly that they sought to interfere for good in human matters, and had lost the power for ever. Whether these creatures faded into mist, or mist enshrouded them, he could not tell, but they and their spirit voices faded together, and the night became as it had been when he walked home. Scrooge closed the window, and examined the door by which the ghost had entered. It was double locked, as he had locked it with his own hands, and the bolts were undisturbed. He tried to say humbug, but stopped at the first syllable, and being from the emotion he had undergone, or the fatigues of the day, or his glimpse of the invisible world, or the dull conversation of the ghost, or the lateness of the hour. Stave I, the first of the three spirits when Scrooge awoke, it was so dark that looking out of bed, he could scarcely distinguish the transparent window from the opaque walls of his. He was endeavoring to pierce the darkness with his furred eyes when the chimes of a neighboring church struck the four quarters. So he listened for the hour. To his great astonishment the heavy bell went on from six to seven, and from seven to eight, and regularly up to twelve, then stopped. Twelve. It was past two when he went to bed. The clock was wrong, and Issachal must have got into the works. Twelve. He touched the spring of his repeater to correct this most preposterous clock. Its rapid little pulse beat twelve, and stopped. Why, it isn't possible, said Scrooge, that I can have slept through a whole day and far into another night. It isn't possible that anything has happened to the sun, and this is twelve at noon, the idea being an alarming one. He scrambled out of bed and groped his way to the window. He was obliged to rub the frost off with the sleeve of his dressing gown before he could see anything, and could see very little then. All he could make out was that it was still very foggy and extremely cold, and that there was no noise of people running to and fro, and making a great stir, as there unquestionably was. This was a great relief, because three days after sight of this first of exchange pay to Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge or his order, and so forth, would have become a mere United States security if there were no days to count by. Scrooge went to bed again, and thought, and thought, and thought it over and over and over, and could make nothing of it. The more he thought, the more perplexed he was, and the more he endeavored not to think, the more he thought. Marley's ghost bothered him exceedingly. Every time he resolved within himself, after mature inquiry, that it was all a dream, his mind flew back again, like a strong spring released, to its first position, and he resolved to lie awake until the hour was past. Considering that he could no more go to sleep than go to heaven, this was perhaps the wisest resolution in his power. The quarter was so long that he was more than once convinced he must have sunk into a doze unconsciously, and missed the clock. 
At length it broke upon his listening ear. Ding dong, a quarter past, said Scrooge, counting. Ding dong, half past, said Scrooge. Ding dong, a quarter to it, said Scrooge. Ding dong, the hour itself, said Scrooge, triumphantly, and nothing else. He spoke before the hour bell sounded, which it now did with a deep, dull hollow. Light flashed up in the room upon the instant, and the curtains of his bed were drawn. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside, I tell you by a hand. Not the curtains at his feet, nor the curtains at his back, but those to which his face was addressed. The curtains of his bed were drawn aside. And Scrooge, starting up into a half-recumbent attitude, found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them. It was a strange figure like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man, viewed through some supernatural medium, which gave him the appearance of having received its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age. And yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were very long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Its legs and feet, most delicately formed, were, like those upper members, bare. It wore a tunic of the purest white, and round its waist was bound a lustrous belt, the sheen of which was beautiful. It held a branch of fresh green holy in its hand, and, in singular contradiction of that wintry emblem, had its dress trimmed with summer flowers. But the strangest thing about it was, that from the crown of its head there sprung a bright clear jet of light, by which all this was visible, and which was doubtless the occasion of its using, in it, even this, though, when Scrooge looked at it with increasing steadiness, was not its strangest quality. For as its belt sparkled and glittered now in one part, and now in another, and what was light one instant, at another time was dark, so the figure itself fluctuated in its and in the very wonder of this, it would be itself again, distinct and clear as ever. Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold to me? asked Scrooge. I am, the voice was soft and gentle, singularly low, as if instead of being so close beside him, it were at a distance. Who and what are you? Scrooge demanded. I am the ghost of Christmas past, long past inquired Scrooge, observant of its dwarfish stature. No, you're past. Perhaps Scrooge could not have told anybody why, if anybody could have asked him, but he had a special desire to see the spirit in his cap. What, exclaimed the ghost, would you so soon put out, with worldly hands, the light I give? Is it not enough that you are one of those whose passions made this cap, and force me through whole he then made bold to inquire what business brought him there. Your welfare, said the ghost. Scrooge expressed himself much obliged, but could not help thinking that a night of unbroken rest would have been more conducive to that end. The spirit must have heard him thinking, for it said immediately you reclamation, then. Take heed. It put out its strong hand as it spoke, and clasped him gently by the arm. Rise and walk with me. It would have been in vain for Scrooge to plead that the weather and the hour were not adapted to pedestrian purposes. That bed was warm, and the thermometer a long way. The grasp, though gentle as a woman's hand, was not to be resisted. He rose, but finding that the spirit made towards the window, clasped his robe in supplication. I am a mortal, Scrooge remonstrated, and liable to fall. Bear but a touch of my hand there said the spirit, laying it upon his heart, and you shall be a Felden. The city had entirely vanished. Not a vestige of it was to be seen. The darkness and the mist had vanished with it, for it was a clear, cold winter day with snow upon the ground. Good heaven, said Scrooge, clasping his hands together, as he looked about him. I was bred in this place. I was a boy here. The spirit gazed upon him mildly. Its gentle touch, though it had been light and instantaneous, 
appeared still present to the old man's sense of feeling. He was conscious of a thousand odors floating in the air, each one connected with a thousand thoughts, and hopes and joys and cares long, long forgotten. Your lip is trembling. And what is that upon your cheek? Scrooge muttered, with an unusual catching in his voice, that it was a pimple, and begged the ghost to lead him where he would. You recollect the way, inquired the spirit. Remember it, cried Scrooge with fervor. I could walk it blindfold. Strange to have forgotten it for so many years, observed the ghost. Let us go on. They walked along the road, Scrooge recognizing every gate, and post, and tree, until a little market town appeared in the distance. With it, some shaggy ponies now were seen trotting towards them with boys upon their backs, who called to other boys in country gigs and carts, driven by farmers. All these boys were in great spirits and shouted to each other, until the broad fields were so full of merry music, that the crisp air laughed to hear it, these are but shadows of the thing. They have no consciousness of us. The jock and travelers came on, and as they came, Scrooge knew and named them every one. Why was he rejoiced beyond all bounds to see them? Why did his cold eye glisten? And his heart leap up as they went past? Why was he filled with gladness when he heard them give each other merry? A solitary child, neglected by his friends, is left there still. Scrooge said he knew it, and he sobbed. They left the high road by a well-remembered lane, and soon approached a mansion of dull red brick, with a little weathercock surmounted cupola on the roof, and a bell hanging in it. It was a large house, but one of broken fortunes. For the spacious offices were little used. Their walls were damp and mossy, their windows broken and their gates Falls clucked and strutted in the stables, and the coach houses and sheds were overrun with grass. Nor was it more retentive of its ancient state within for entering the dreary hall and glancing through the open doors of many rooms. They found them poorly furnished, cold, and vast. There was an earthy savour in the air, a chilly bareness in the place, which associated itself somehow with too much getting up by candle light and not too much to eat. They went, the ghost and Scrooge, across the hall, to a door at the back of the house. It opened before them, and disclosed a long, bare, melancholy room, made bare still by lines of plain deal forms and desks. At one of these a lonely boy was reading near a feeble fire, and Scrooge sat down upon a form, and wept to see his poor forgotten self as he used to be not a latent echo in the house, not a squeak and scuffle from the mice behind the panelling, not a drip from the half-thawed water spout of the dull yard behind, not a sigh among the leaves. The spirit touched him on the arm, and pointed to his younger self, intent upon his reading. Suddenly a man in foreign garments, wonderfully real and distinct to look at, stood outside the window, with an axe stuck in his belt, and leading by the bridle and asked, Why, it's Ali Baba! Scrooge exclaimed in ecstasy. It's dear old honest Ali Baba. Yes, yes, I know, one Christmas time, when yonder solitary child was left here all alone, he did come, for the first time. Poor boy and Valentine, said Scrooge, and his wild brother, Orson. There they go, and what's his name? who was put down in his drawers. I'm glad of it. What business had he to be married to the princess? To hear Scrooge expending all the earnestness of his nature on such subjects, in a most extraordinary voice between laughing and crying. There's the parrot, cried Scrooge. Green body and yellow tail, with a thing like a lettuce growing out at the top of his head. There he is, poor Robin Crusoe. He called him. When he came home again after sailing, poor Robin Crusoe, where have you been, Robin Crusoe? The man thought he was dreaming, but he wasn't. It was the parrot, you know. There goes Friday, running for his life to the little creek. Hallo, hoop, hallo, then, with a rapidity of transition very foreign to his usual character, he said in pity for his former self. I wish, Scrooge muttered, 
putting his hand in his pocket and looking about him after drying his eyes with his cuff. But it's too late now. What is the matter? asked. Nothing, said Scrooge. Nothing. There was a boy singing a Christmas carol at my door last night. I should like to have given him something. That's all. The ghost smiled thoughtfully and waved its hand, saying as it did so, let us see another Christmas. Scrooge. The panels shrunk. The windows cracked. Fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling, and the naked laths were shown instead. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge. He only knew that it was quite correct, that everything had happened so, that there he was, alone again, when all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost, and with a mournful shaking of his head, glanced anxiously towards the door. It opened, and a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in, and putting her arms about his neck, and often kissing him, addressed him as her dear, to bring you home, 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 little fan, returned the boy. Yes, said the child, brimful of glee, home for good and all, home for ever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be, that home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And you were to be a man, said the child, opening her eyes, and are never to come back here. But first, we were to be together all the Christmas long, and have the merriest time. She clapped her hands and laughed, and tried to touch his head. But being too little, laughed again, and stood on tiptoe to embrace him. Then she began to drag him, in her childish eagerness, towards the door, and he, nothing loath to go, accompanied her. A terrible voice in the hall cried, Bring down Master Scrooge's box, there, and in the hall appeared the schoolmaster himself, who glared on Master Scrooge with a ferocious con. He then conveyed him and his sister into the veriest old well of a shivering best parlour that ever was seen, where the maps upon the wall, and the celestial and terrestrial globes in the windows, here he produced a decanter of curiously light wine, and a block of curiously heavy cake, and administered instalments of those dainties to the young people. At the same time, Master Scrooge's trunk being by this time tied on to the top of the chaise, the children bade the schoolmaster good-bye right willingly, and getting into it, drove gaily down the garden sweep. Always a delicate creature, whom a brief might have withered, said the ghost, but she had a large heart, so she had cried Scrooge. You are right. I will not gainsay it, spirit. God forbid. She died a woman, said the ghost, and had, as I think, children. One child, Scrooge returned. True, said the ghost. Your nephew, Scrooge, seemed uneasy in his mind, and answered briefly. Yes, Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thorough. It was made plain enough, by the dressing of the shops, that here too it was Christmas time again, but it was evening, and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door, and asked Scrooge if he knew it. No, it said Scrooge. Was I apprenticed here? They went in. At sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk, that if he had been two inches taller he must have knocked his head against the ceiling. Scrooge cried in great He rubbed his hands, adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself, from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and called out in a comfortable Dick Wilkins, to be sure, said Scrooge to the ghost. Bless me, yes. There he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo-ho, my boys, said Fezziwig. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas Eve, Ezer. Let's have the shutters up, cried old Fezziwig, with a sharp clap of his hands before a man can say Jack Robinson.
Hilly ho, cried old Fezziwig, skipping down from the high desk with wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, Dick, cheer up, Ebenezer, clear away. There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have. Cl it was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off as if it were dismissed from public life for evermore. The floor was swept and watered, the lamps were trimmed fuel was heaped upon the fire in came a fiddler with a music book and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like fifty stomach hatches in came mrs fezziwig one vast substantial smile in came the three miss fezziwigs beaming and lovable in came the six young followers whose hearts they broke in came all the young men and women employed in the business in came the housemaid with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In came the boy from over the way, who was suspected of not having bored enough from his master, trying to hide himself behind the girl from next door but one, who was proved to have had her. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing some pulling in they all came away they all went twenty couple at once hands half round and back again the other way down the middle and up again round and round in various but scorning rest upon his reappearance he instantly began again though there were no dancers yet as if the other fiddler had been carried home exhausted on a shutter there were more dances and there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled, when the fiddler, an artful dog, mind, the sort of man who knew his business better than you or I could have told Fezwick, top couple, two, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them three or four and twenty pair of partners people who were not to be trifled with people who would but if they had been twice as many a uh, four times old fezziwig would have been a match for them and so would mrs fezziwig as to her she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term if that's not high praise tell me higher and i'll use it l a positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like moons. You couldn't have predicted, at any given time, what would have become of them next. And when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, both hands to your partner, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle, and back again to you. When the clock struck eleven, this domestic ball broke up. Mr. And Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired but the two prentices, they did the same to them, and thus the cheerful voices died away, and the lads were left to their beds, which were under account. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his wits. His heart and soul were in the scene, and with his former self. He corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the strangest agitation. It was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost, and became conscious that it was looking full upon him, while the light upon a small matter, said the ghost to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small, it showed Scrooge. The spirit signed to him to listen to the two apprentices, who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig, and when he had done so, said why is it not he has spent but a few pounds 
is that so much that he deserves this praise. It isn't that, said Scrooge, heated by the remark, and speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. 